about Duncanly documents, and there, there are some, but not many. And what I had hoped, which does not exist, is, is um, Donovan's diaries for mm. 1948, when wow. the accusations were becoming public, what his reactions would have been in his own diary. Unfortunately, those records are, uh, Destroyed. are, are either that or, or were never collected or, or lost. Are there heirs? Pardon me? Are there heirs to Donovan? I mean, who might have it, you mean? You know, the, when the Donovan, Anthony K. Brown was a British scholar who had access to all of Donovan's, mm -hmm. you know, papers. And, and as far as I can tell from Brown's own writings, he was given everything. There would have been no reason to Hold take, take that, yeah. that year. I, I don't think they were ever preserved or, or they were lost. I mean, there is some evidence that Donovan did keep a diary? or There is. Oh. There is. Seems extraordinary. Yeah, yeah. So that was, I was uh, hoping to uh, to get that. I mean, we, we may never know. That may be one of the great mm -hmm. unanswered mm -hmm. questions. You've got some who say he did, some who say he didn't, some who said, you know what, it really wasn't that much of a of a, a problem anyway. So mm -hmm. that's that. Uh, so the CIA didn't know about Venona until, until 1952. Right. So the work he did. He did really for the CAT would have been done without the CIA necessarily. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Well, that's too bad in a way. Cause it would Correct. Be very yeah. helpful if we could show they were aware of that and nevertheless yeah, decided to uh, apparently even, work with them. He, yeah. uh, apparently, even even Harry Truman wasn't told of Venona. Wow. That was one of the great things that Moynihan stumbled upon that Omar Bradley. And chief of staff. Made the decision to keep uh -huh. this. Yeah, and, and the FBI, of course, didn't want to share it with, with, with them anyway. Something? So, yeah. That's pretty amazing. Yeah, it, it, well, it, it still goes on today. <laughs> I know. I mean, so, uh, <laughs> sharing or, or refusing to share. So, anyway, yeah, I mean, the Venona intercepts are, are being decoded. And, you know, Duncan Hill is supposed to be this Koch, K O C H. Uh -huh. But as you know, in this recent Kai Bird article on, on Alger Hiss, I mean, it's very difficult. These things are, 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 are horrible hearsay, and the NSA has never released the actual raw cables. Mm -hmm. So I could get a translator who may see them a different way. Yeah, yeah. But they've never ever released these things, and there are about 3,000 or something they can't break. They're just lost in time. The program ran until about 1980. That's how, how much wow. effort they put into put these into things. Put into trying to do Started doing it, started breaking them in, in, in the mid 40s. And the first one was done, I think, in 46. First message was was cracked, and it, it had to do with Alice uh, Alamos. Interestingly enough, oh, so yeah? yeah, so yeah, it was important. And I actually met the chief codebreaker before he died, Meredith Gardner, and, mm -hmm. and uh, he was a, just a really fascinating type. He said that the problem with the NSA was it wasn't the NSA; it was an Army Security Agency. They had the technical expertise, but none of the names made any sense to them. Yes. And so they had to bring in the FBI to try to marry up its files uh -huh. with yeah. mm -hmm. the arm with the raw data mm -hmm. and say, wait a minute, okay. This guy, who's, who's at the State Department, and who, mm -hmm. who, who actually you know, knows him, and, uh -huh. and this and that, so that's how they were able to piece this thing together. Mm -hmm. But they didn't want the agency to do it, because the agency had been riddled with spies during World War II, and mm -hmm. so they didn't want to risk sharing this back. So it was from the point of view of the FBI all right. along, then? Correct. The irony of this was, is that the uh, Russians, uh, through the hospices, they had a guy named uh, William Wiesband. Then the, the work took place over here at Arlington Hall, off of Washington Boulevard, <laughs> off 50 over there. And that was a great code breaking center. And um, Russians had an um, analyst in there who was told them by 45, 46 that the codes had been broken. So they immediately began to shift and switch their, <laughs> their codes. Also, too, Kim Philby was in Washington. And Philby, of course, was a great. He in he, yeah, he was. Yeah, I'm waiting. Yeah. I did not know And he, he came and actually, uh, Meredith Gardner, the guy I spoke to, said, you know, he used to look, come in and look over my shoulder from time to time when we were breaking these, these things. And he would Jeez. pass the messages on back to Moscow. So, you know, we, we had a window. Yeah. And we collected a lot of messages. They were coming out of Washington and also coming out of New York, back to Moscow. And we got about six, 7,000 of them. But then the, all of a sudden, the <laughs> the, the codes began to shift and they began to change. This whole thing is really a hole of mirrors. Yeah, so, so, so we're, we just had the snapshot and, and yeah. then it, 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 we never did again. Well, the Soviet never did again. surely have well, that's, copies of that, everything. That's where this, this, this story gets, gets, gets complicated. I mean, I, I've always said 